Good afternoon. I'd like to call to order the Public Works Finance and Safety Committee meeting of Monday, December 17, 2018. And the first item on the agenda is approval of the consent agenda. Is there a motion and second for approval? Move. Moved by Manti, second by Bueller. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Second item is public input. And this is the time reserved for anyone who would like to make a public comment on something that's not on the agenda. If anyone would like to do that, please step forward. See none, we'll move on. Item three is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion and second for approval? Moved by Bueller. Second, second by Vilhauer. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item four is an update from Retail Strategies, Inc. And we have Beth Miller um, on the phone, and she has a presentation loaded up um, with the help of our awesome IT department. So, um, Beth, I will let you take it away. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank you all for giving us the opportunity to give you guys a quick update on the work we've been doing on your behalf for the past two years. Um, as Mayor Karen said, my name is Beth Miller, and I also have Kate Ryan here with me, uh, both from Retail Strategies. And um, Mayor, can you hear us okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Perfect. Okay, well, we'll, go, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, I do want to do a brief overview about our company, our services, and uh, a little bit about our history, maybe for a handful of people that weren't involved since the beginning of the engagement. But I will keep this brief because I, I know you guys' uh, time is very valuable. Um, as most of you know, Retail Strategies partners with municipalities across the country to help communities get their name out in front of the right people in the retail real estate community and in the end, hopefully bring retail to the market. Uh, we accomplished this, as you can see here, by initially analyzing the market and then coming up with a strategic game plan. And then we actively recruit retailers um, at the same time as we're speaking to brokers and landlords and property owners uh, within Watertown. We always um, like to say that our process really works best when we have a great partner. Um, the city of Watertown and all of you and Mayor Karen are obviously the local expert. Uh, we like to feel that we are the retail real estate expert and really working together is where this really, um, really where we find success. Um, when it's a true partnership and information is shared both ways and Mayor Karen has been a pleasure to work with and uh, very responsive and helps us get what we need and we have monthly monthly calls where we relay information back to her and the team uh, to make sure that they know what's, what we're working on um, each month. So a little bit more about our team. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Beth Miller and I'm the Portfolio Director. I'm the day-to-day -day contact uh, with Mayor Karen. Um, and the team there in Watertown, um, providing updates and um, sharing information, as well as reaching out to property owners and um, landlords uh, within the region. Um, Kate Ryan, who I have here with me as well, is our retail um, recruiter, and she's the one really day in, day out. Uh, we work very closely as a team, but she's the one really speaking to retailers, tenant rep brokers, and people like that. On the next line, you'll see uh, Robert and Mead um, are the two owners of our company, and our company was born out of a traditional uh, real estate brokerage house. Uh, they both have well over 20 years of experience um, in retail real estate, and they basically, when they were doing developments and other projects around the southeast, they found a need um, that communities had to try to recruit retail, and, and hence our uh, company was born back in 2011. Um, as you know, we've been working with you guys for about two years, um, going about to go into our third. Um, and, and our goals for our partnership is obviously to increase uh, local tax revenue, attract desired retail, and improve the quality of life, and also create jobs. This is a little bit about our initial and ongoing discovery phase. Um, of our process. So when we initially engaged two years ago, we spent the first few months of, of our engagement um, doing all the research and analyzing the market and running all the demographics to make sure we really understand the market. Uh, we also keep track of retailers' expansion plans and things like that. Um, we changed data providers a couple of years ago from Esri to Tetrad. 
Uh, we found that Tetrad was considerably more reliable and also the demographic provider that a lot of the larger retailers were using in-house. And that gave us a lot of confidence in our choice to change. Um, so you guys have access to all sorts of demographic information. We're constantly running reports and updating this information um, every six months to every year. One other tool that we really focus on, and this one has a large effect for us and helps us a lot, especially in Watertown. It's called MOBA data, Mobile Data Collection. Um, I'll explain this briefly, but it's very, it, it's a little Big Brother-ish. Um, but basically, the, what it does is this has replaced what retailers used to use, which was really the credit card tracking to figure out where your uh, clientele for retailers are coming from. So you'll see here the, the, red on, the red dots on the map is obviously the most concentrated area where people are shopping. But this is just an example. And basically the way it works is you can draw a polygon around any retail, um, retail or any really building, I guess, in the, in the area. This one is run from the Walmart. And so basically you draw a polygon and then you set a time frame. So this time frame was set from September of 2017 to September of 2018. And what this shows us is where people are shopping, coming to shop from. So this is, like I've mentioned, very important for Watertown because obviously um, in states like South Dakota, people travel a lot further than they do in other markets around the country. What you'll see here, this is the traditional way retailers used to look at demographics. And this tells you a lot of information, and I'm really just showing you to tell you that this is really not what people look at anymore, which is good and thankful. This just shows radius rings and drive times um, from the city center. So you'll see here, what we're able to do off of that mobile tracking data is to draw a customized trade area. So when we, can, when we send Watertown out to potential retailers, um, we're going to show them a customized trade area with demographics in that trade area, showing that, as you all know, and what we're trying to make sure the retailers know, that people are driving much further than other parts of the country. You'll see here that trade area alone that I just showed you from uh, the Walmart, uh, 171,000 people, which, as, as we all know, is much larger than the population of the city limits. So when retailers see this, it, sometimes it helps us get their attention that maybe they had thought Watertown wasn't a market for them, and we could tell them that, yes, it is. Um, this is just an example. Uh, we can draw, we draw trade areas regularly when we send out um, information on the market to retailers because, obviously, people are going to come further for Walmart than they are for, say, a, a quick service restaurant, fast food type restaurant. So we have the ability, and we do this regularly, we draw trade areas for the retailer we're actually reaching out to to show them what they could really expect um, coming into the market. Now I want to jump on into some specifics about the work we've done for Watertown over the past two years. Um, we've made connections and formed great relationships with many brokers and landowners. Uh, we also regularly provide site-specific reports, as we just mentioned, to retailers as well as developers. And we've also provided many trend reports and free webinars that have been passed on to the team working with us. So you'll see here our initial uh, retail prospect list had 66 retailers on it. This was run from a void report and us also coming in and knowing what seems to be maybe realistic and maybe not. Um, and so you can see we contacted over 66% of that original list. We also have some tools that I've actually passed on to the mayor of a new void report um, that we have access to that, that helps us pull more regional and, and local type retailers as well. Um, so we've added to our prospect list over the past two years, and you can see here on the right that there are three active deals we have in progress. We're continuing our outreach regularly, obviously, as well, but there are three deals right now that we feel very confident in and hope that we can announce um, in the near future. I wanted to talk a little bit about retailer feedback. We find this very, very valuable. These are just a few samples of types of retailers and retailer names. This is obviously not everyone, but of retailers that we have reached out to over the past couple years. Um, and we also try to track what people tell us. If, if there's reasons they're saying no, we find that information valuable as well and make sure we pass it on to our team. Obviously, if it's something that we could fix, then that's even, even better news. But it is good to just know what the retailers are telling us. Um, you'll see here some that jump out to me, you know, franchisee issues. Well, maybe there's a retailer that wants to be here, but they don't have a franchisee in the area. We make sure we pass that along. You guys may have someone local that might be interested in purchasing a franchise. Um, distribution, we've run into that sometimes if people don't have um, 
local stores in the region already. Sometimes the distribution can be challenging. So this is just a few examples we wanted to go over for retailer feedback. Um, also wanted to say how excited we are about uh, Planet Fitness announcing to open uh, at the mall. Um, we are very, very excited about this. We uh, This deal happened pretty quickly. Um, it was one of the first retailers we reached out to at the beginning of the engagement. Um, this obviously is going to be Create Jobs, a new very good credit retailer to bring to, to town. But most importantly for us, we are just really excited that they've chosen the mall. Um, as everyone knows, malls are a struggle uh, this day and age. Uh, people are closing. A lot of the, as we've experienced here, uh, the department stores are closing. So gyms are the perfect fit to kind of pick off, and they're, they're really going in and taking, um, taking vacant boxes and things like that. So we hope that this is just the beginning of some really good things to come to the mall, but um, are very pleased that they chose the mall. Um, real quick, wanted to go over a retail timeline uh, to follow the Planet Fitness thing. That deal was pretty quick for us. That's why we normally, all of our contracts, we do ask for a three-year engagement. Um, an average retail deal takes 18 to 36 months from start to finish, and that's just the way it is, unfortunately. Um, a lot slower than we would like, and I know you would like. Uh, that's why I did mention this Planet Fitness deal was pretty quick, so we were pleased about that. But um, all these here are going to just show you what goes into um, a retail deal and why it does take so long. Um, you know, from the local tenant rep person, identifying markets they're going to expand in, identifying sites. And where we really like to come in is this is where we hopefully can speed up their process. So if, if there's a tenant rep that knows that they need to do 10 stores, we're sending them the market and we're telling them what site they need to go on to hopefully help them and cut out some work and then faster be able to bring retailers to Watertown. Um, again, these are just all the items that go in. Um, they have to go to real estate committee. They have to visit the market. Um, they've got to find a developer to maybe do their store all before they open. So this is just, it's a process. And the retailer does make the final decision. We can put the right site in front of them, and they may do something crazy that we can't control, unfortunately. Okay, real quick, I promise I'm going to be done rambling shortly, um, but a few things. Just moving forward, um, I wanted to talk about, um, this is our marketing guide here that um, the mayor and the team have access to. This is what we use in our day-to-day -day recruitment. So when we're reaching out to retailers or tenant rep brokers, this is the document we're sending out when we're representing you um, at all of the ICSC conferences, which is the International Council of Shopping Centers um, across the country. This is the the flyer and the marketing material that we are giving um, to the potential retailers. Uh, we have a, over 135 clients now, I believe, across the country. So the retailers have really grown to know our brand and know what these marketing flyers look like and know exactly where to go um, if, for whatever their need is. Some retailers need a certain population. Some need a certain income, things like that. So they can really follow our marketing guides very well. This was tweaked a little bit for Watertown in the beginning uh, because we do have a much higher, up there at the top, we have much higher radius rings and much higher drive times because, as we all know, um, that's what makes sense for Watertown. Um, I also mentioned Recon. Uh, this is the real estate convention in Las Vegas in May every year um, that we attend on your behalf. Um, it's a great show. There's over 35,000 people. We have meetings day in, day out for three days. It's an exhausting trip, but always very valuable. A lot of times, you know, we met with the Planet Fitness folks last year um, at the show. A lot of times it just helps push deals across the line. You know, just like with anything, if you're exchanging phone calls and emails back and forth, things can tend to drag on. But to get face-to-face -face and really have some good meetings um, is, is super valuable to, to our process. Here you see again, this is again about the ICSC shows. We attend all the regional shows as well. Uh, we attended the Chicago show, which is definitely the show that um, affects you guys the most. Uh, we were there in October this year and had a great show as well. So in closing, I uh, just wanted to let you know that we're continuing to work hard on behalf of Watertown. We continuously update our strategy. Like I mentioned, we um, are constantly updating our demographics, running new demographics every year. Um, also, remember that we have access to all this data and research that we are happy to run any reports that you guys ever need. Um, just give us a couple days and feel free to, to reach out. 
Uh, we also really focus on following retail expansion and trends. I know a lot of times we'll post things on our base camp system, which is what the, the team has access to. Um, just with trends and things happening, no, you know, it's really important for us to know who's growing, how many stores they're going to do in the next year, as well as who's closing. If we can stay ahead of that, those are really good things for us to know so we can get ahead of the game and get those vacant spaces in front of the right people first. Um, so anyway, that is, um, I just want to thank you guys for your time this afternoon. And I know, Mayor, you said maybe um, there would be some questions. Yes, thank you, Beth. Council members, mm -hmm. do you, any of you have questions for retail strategies? Councilman Roby? What's the biggest challenge you've come up against so far in terms of marketing Watertown? Um, I would say the biggest challenge has been a lot of the retailers we reach out to, first of all, maybe the national guys aren't, aren't in the region yet or just have one store in, in Sioux Falls and they seem they just can't get past the distance um, for some distribution purposes. But also I would say it has been a challenge to show them that the market is much larger than we all know it is. Um, you know, a lot of people listen to us and some people, some people just don't. And to that point, uh, you know, I just want to let you guys know that we, we mark in our spreadsheets if somebody tells us no, you know, that doesn't mean no. We don't take no very well. So we make sure that we have it noted in our system that we reach back out in six months because people's expansion plans and things like that are always changing. They get new real estate directors who have completely different opinions than maybe the first guy did. So we're always reaching back out when they tell us no. But to that point as well, like I mentioned, we've got some really good active deals going. And in the world of what we do, we have a lot of success in Watertown. And we, um, we've been very pleased with the reaction of the retailers toward the market. Thank you. Other questions? Councilman Vilhauer? Uh Beth, you, you referenced uh, Planet Fitness and you and the three uh, active deals uh, um, in mm -hmm. progress. What else, uh, any, any others in the last two years that you can uh, point to uh, as far as your involvement that caused them to come to Watertown? Um, the Planet Fitness deal is the only public deal right now, obviously, that's a signed deal that we were um, involved in from day one, from talking with the mall as well as the retailer and basically handing, you know, handing them off to each other. Um, so that's the one deal that is solid and, and done. Um, I would say there's going to be a lot more. There's going to be a lot more to follow. Like I said, there are three that are active, one being a limited service restaurant um, and one being um, a grocery, a small grocery, as well as um, – the, a discount retailer is all I can really say there. So a national discount retailer. Other questions? Councilwoman Manti? <coughs> Hi, Beth. My name is Beth, too. Um, Hi, anyway, Beth. <laughs> I don't know if you recall when we first uh, talked to you in the original agreement to hire you, I was the one who uh, probably beat the drum on downtown um, empty building backfall fill and uh, leapfrogging over existing properties and things that we had opportunities for. And I do understand based on some of the things that you've discussed and things that I've researched, but could you give me a little bit of an idea what specifics perhaps that you've gone to to look at businesses that may be appropriate for our downtown? Um, empty building backfill. The three things that I felt were the most important to me um, to have answered in terms of my agreement to hire. That was a lot. Right, of, absolutely. Uh, ask me if As you me. mentioned, go ahead. Oh, I said I can break. If it gets too much, I can ask them once, one at a time. I'm sorry. I no, no, I'll, I'll go for it. And then if I miss something, just let me know. Um, we definitely did that first trip that uh, my coworker Derek and I came into the market. We cataloged a handful of properties downtown. Um, we spoke with a handful of property owners as well. Um, and I can go back at our list and, and get you that information um, as well to the specifics. Um, but as you mentioned, downtown, especially for the national retailers, are challenging. Uh, we definitely have put some spaces in front of the, you know, your sandwich type users. Um, some smaller restaurant type people that they tend to consider downtown more than more than other national retailers. 
Um, so there, there has been a focus, but as, as you know, it, it just from our perspective, it is more of a challenge. So it is something that's on our radar and something that we do work on. It's just not as, um, as easy, I would say. <laughs> not that any of it's easy, but um, that it's just not as, as easy to get those things done. Um, and again, I'm trying to, what was your next question? Is there something else? Yeah, I talked about empty building backfill, and you mentioned that a little bit, but also kind of leapfrogging over uh, areas where we have a lot of real estate that's empty or may need to be um, or may be perfect for a company. We've had that happen before where a business says, hey, that building is perfect rather than build a new one. We're just going to move over there across the street. So we have that works out ideally. Right. So backfilling these empty buildings and then also my fear of leapfrogging over a lot of existing good properties and good mm -hmm. real, empty real estate in favor of um, some of the uh, mm -hmm. new areas. Right. You know, we, we've definitely had a lot of focus on some of the existing retail, not necessarily just downtown, but obviously the mall and a couple of other regions of town that, that we have focused on. And we've, we've really pushed hard for the vacant spaces at the mall. Um, the, you know, sometimes, uh, as we said earlier, the retailer is going to make the final decision and we can push them and point them in certain directions. But in the end, they're going to do what their business model says and what they think is best. Um, however, I did also mention the prospect list and, and I had sent this to Mayor and the team probably four or five months ago, maybe even a little longer. But we do have access to a new tool that creates a prospect list and a void list for the market that has a lot more than the um, the original prospect list, or the void analysis we did, had the top 500 national retailers um, in the country. So this new um, tool that we have access to, it pulls a lot of regional people, which those types of people also are going to be much more willing to, to consider a downtown maybe. Um, we, can, we can take the form to where it basically says, you know, somebody that has five or more stores. So, so we, we really like that number because five or more stores means that the people, for the most part, know what they're doing. They have multiple locations. They might be willing to do another location. However, um, they might look at some downtown options. So that's a new thing that we have access to. And Kate and I both, especially Kate, has been spending a lot of time really trying to drum through that list. We've also sent it to the team to maybe, if, you know, any help we can get from you guys to, to sort of scroll through that. A lot of the regional guys we may not know, and there may be somebody on that list that you guys think is perfect and you really want us to track it down. But one by one, we're going through that list and we're doing research on who these people are and who these regional retailers are that we may not know and see who might be a fit. I think you got it. Thank you. Councilman Danforth. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I've got a few questions uh, to go through with you. But, Beth, are you, what are you seeing in retail and, and restaurant losses um, at, with communities that are, you know, comparable to our size? You know, we've seen a number of retail hits and some restaurant losses, uh, very little coming back in. What are you seeing in other communities that are not attached to a larger metropolitan area or, uh, uh, but, but standalone communities like a Watertown. What are you seeing happening in those communities? As far as, I'm sorry, I just want to as make sure. As far as the loss, um, the outgoing of business. Oh, the, the outgoing of, so the retailers leaving the market. Right. Um, well, it, it seems pretty similar across the board. Um, you know, there's de there's definitely a lot of it's the type of retailer that's closing, and there's different types of retailer that are that's opening. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot of the full service restaurants. Um, a lot of the full service restaurants they're not expanding, they're not really doing anything. A lot of them are closing. The category restaurant wise that really seems to be growing is limited service. Um, those guys, kind of the in between folks between the the fast food and the uh, lim and the full service, excuse me. Uh, a lot of growth there, a lot of growth in the discounter world. Um, uh, clothing is a very tough category. That's been a, lot, a focus of ours um, as well, as we know that there's a, a void in the market. Um, unfortunately, there's just not a lot of clothing retailers that are expanding. Uh, the ones that are need a lot larger population. 
Um, but we're, we're still digging and trying to find, find those guys. There's, there's definitely people that are growing and there's a very negative attitude, um, kind of across the board with the closures in the department stores and, uh, some of the full service restaurants, but we're also seeing a lot of people growing and a lot of activity. Okay. So follow up question to that, you know, excluding restaurants of every kind and, and really talking about general retail that typically isn't franchised. Is there much activity on expansion taking place? Because I look at it, and if we don't get a restaurant in town, then I can go someplace else to eat. But where we're at today is I really have almost no place to go to buy men's clothes, for example. So mm -hmm. I'm looking at it more from true retail and not the, the food service industry. So where where is that market at? Is there... Is there a likelihood that there are companies out there within our region, whether they be regional or national, that, that are going to expand in this climate? Right. Um, no, and I hear you, and this is something that, that is just a struggle in the retail world, unfortunately. There are people, but they're just few and far between is the best answer I can give you. Um, there are guys, like I said, I, I, think there's some, I think there's a play for some of the bigger guys those things just take time, and it's just going to be us beating the door down and, and getting their attention. Um, it's just very few to to even go after. I think this is one of the categories that has been just very hard hit by the Internet. And my last question I had is, the original list contained 66 uh, possible candidates. You said 40 mm -hmm. were added, and you contacted 44. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if 66 were originally on there, what has limited you to not contacting all 66 in a two-year period? Right. Well, it, it's a process. When we reach out to these guys, it is not a um, simple it, – it takes time. So we, we really dig in. We really run these reports. We really make sure that we get them the right information. Um, some guys on that original prospect list, you know, you might have had – I'd have to look back at it, but you might have had a, a Sears or someone who, who is not expanding. So when we get the initial void analysis and we run through that, we go through, first of all, and make sure what's very realistic. Uh, there may be somebody on there that only takes second-generation space that maybe isn't available the size they need, or maybe we know that they won't go into malls, et cetera. So we're really doing our back work before we reach out to all these retailers, and that's very important in what we do because – the retailers trust us, and they know us, and they respond to us. And so we don't willy-nilly just send them things um, because we want to make sure that it's, it's competent and it's correct and it's a real possibility for them. And it's an ongoing thing. This is an ever-changing list, and an ever -cha that's why, like I mentioned, we follow the trends in the retail and know if somebody's not expanding or if somebody's closing every store, will they come off the list? And then at the same time, we're going through the new list and trying to add people back. Okay. Does that answer your question, Mike? Other council questions? I'm not seeing any. Well, I thank you very much, Beth, for your update. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Your, thank you, Mayor. Appreciate this very much. So. Have a good day. Absolutely. Well, thank you all uh, for your time, and happy holidays. Thank you. Bye now. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, that was just a discussion. There will be action at the full council meeting um, at the end of the agenda. Item number five on the agenda is consideration of resolution number 18-51 authorizing the mayor to sign a bridge improvement grant application for the third avenue northwest bridge replacement project number 1706 and consideration for professional service agreements with idg related to the project design heath would you please explain this thank you madam mayor um, so what i'd like to summarize for the council this evening in the work session environment here is uh I'll break it down into three separate components, but all related to the same project. Uh, we have before you tonight the resolution for an application to the state's bridge improvement grant program. 
and I believe you're all familiar with this, back in March or May, earlier this year, before, before me coming on, there was discussion on, uh, first of all, the need for that structure to be replaced up on 3rd Avenue Northwest, and the condition of that structure, and some of the big uh, program funding that we had applied for previously, and not successful in receiving back in 2017 um, regarding design funds. Um, but we're to a point now today where we've worked with our consultant, Infrastructure Design Group. Vanessa is here this evening from, uh, from Infrastructure Design Group to help talk about this. Um, but generally where we're at today is the new round of big applications are due January 2nd of 2019. And in order to apply for that round of funding, this is the first step, the resolution of support that the city council would uh, give the mayor authority to sign in support of that grant application. So that's component number one is the resolution of support for the grant application. The other component uh, is kind of split into two separate areas. Um, and that is the professional service agreements with infrastructure design group for their design services for the structure which are grant eligible for funding reimbursement under the big uh, program that the DOT manages. And the second component is also engineering design services with IDG for the roadway design for 3rd Avenue Northwest. And that component outside the footprint of the bridge and immediately adjacent to the bridge within so many feet um, outside of that extent is not eligible for that big program and needs to be funded 100% by the city and is why there's two separate action items uh, for those two agreements. Um, those three action items are on the consent agenda at the regular meeting tonight. I just wanted to point that out in case anybody uh, had any concerns or questions they wanted to discuss in the regular meeting about any one of those three components. Uh, but it is on the consent agenda for the resolution and the uh, execution of the professional services agreement for the bridge and for 3rd Avenue Northwest. It's not on the consent agenda at the moment, but I intend to move it to consent agenda unless there's any objections to doing that after our discussion. Councilman Roby? Uh, just a question. I know that uh, I'm glad we're applying for the grant. The question I have is local match plays into the scoring and how much you decide to offer as local match. What was your, your strategy there? Yeah, and I could let Vanessa field that as far as preliminary discussions and how we're sitting right now. I believe we are not anticipating anything more than the usual 20% minimum local match, mm -hmm. um, but we had discussed potentially increasing that amount depending on what the results of the April award, bid awards are, or grant awards are, excuse me. Uh, I'm going to go just a little bit into the history of the project. Uh, we did finish the hydraulics and the type size and location of the structure back in March, which basically we, we analyze the river, we do a full topo su study, and then we pick the best possible structure that can go in its replacement. Um, so a letter of the TSNL and all the findings are included in the packet. At that time was also when it was discussed of extending the project limits because ultimately it's a bridge improvement grant. It's for bridges, um, not necessarily for roadways. And so no matter what, the city would be in charge of doing the surfacing adjacent to the structure, not necessarily the grading. Um, so with all that in mind, I was here in May um, before Shane left and we had discussed kind of a, a game plan going forward for the bid, big improvement grant. Basically, yes, you are correct. You can add more than 20%. Um, if you added up to 50%, I don't have a copy of the memo, but if you added up to 50% of the grant total, it would be $800,000 out of the city's pocket and you'd get 10 points. Same logic goes forward, and you can have bid-ready plans. So we would do the design. So if we don't get the big improvement grant this year, we'd proceed on the design. And for our design fee, we'd have them already reviewed by the DOT. So next year, you get those 10 extra points. So the, the difference in the design fee for the bridge itself versus a 50% match, it's behooving for the city to go forward with the design. 
Any other questions? Councilman Vilhar? Um, and if, if this grant is, is not approved at some point, the whole cost falls on the city then, is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, it, it is a gamble going forward with just the, the 20% right now. Um, the, in it being awarded in this grant cycle. Basically, the big improvement grant money has doubled this year, so there, there's more money to give out. But and the score is competitive, but I can't give you a clear-cut answer on whether or not you're actually going to get the award this year. Next year, it would actually increase to almost 63, which is an, an astounding score. Um, this probably isn't a fair question because I can't remember myself. I read someplace just recently, it may have been the South Dakota Municipal League magazine, that, that there's being more restrictions or some, some projects or more projects or types of projects are being rejected or, or not eligible. It, it, is my question making any sense from your history, Vanessa? I just don't remember where I saw that, but it caught my eye, but it, it slipped my mind now. Um, not necessarily. They kind of look at it as a region. Um, if, and that's kind of more for counties. For example, Brookings County has been the recipient of a lot of big improvement grants, and they've also put forward a lot of money. Um, so to try to level the playing field, um, they'd like to see other regions. Please, Don, you would know. No, I just had a comment to that. When, when somebody gets knocked out of the process or gets knocked down at points, they didn't follow the directions. I mean, you got to follow a very clear, as I believe, set of regulations and rules. It's very formulaic, very little uh, subjectivity in the process. So there have been an instance or two I'm aware of where a project was kicked out because they didn't follow all the requirements. Um, and for the big replacement, um, that's based right off of your bridge inspection. I can run a big spo score. It's right in the federal highway. Everything that I p input all of your inspection data into. So as far as that score, it's pretty straightforward. When you get to preservations, like we did on the bypass on 20th Avenue, that's a little bit more subjective of points can go one way or the other, but in general, as long as your project is all-encompassing and you are trying to truly fix the problem at hand and not piecemealing a project together, you're going to get awarded. Councilman Danforth? And I'm going to use this term not because it's the way we want it. It's just kind of the process. But <clears throat> as the can gets kicked down the road for bridge replacement, how long can we go with this bridge? I mean, are we... It, I mean, if you drive over it looks terrible, but that doesn't mean it's structurally not good. But so how long can this bridge go before it just has to be replaced without endangering the public? Uh, it, it's, you know, we continue to monitor the bridge. It's part of the bridge in, or your bridge inspection every two years. It is posted at a safe level. Um, that's the reason that we post bridges. It's not that if you drive over the bridge at an 18 tons, that it's going to collapse. We post it safely, so it's how many cycles that bridge can take. So <clears throat> the wanted goal is for construction of this bridge in 2020. Um, and the other wanted goal was not to have two crossings of the Big Sioux down at the same time. And with 212 being done, hopefully in 2019, that really does put us at 2020 for this bridge. And so I believe it is obtainable. Um, so you should not see another load restriction. We wouldn't close the bridge. It would, the load rating would go down. Um, and I think it's a manageable load rating right now. We're not restricting that much traffic. Okay, so we really don't have a, an impending problem in the reasonably near future. No. Okay. Good question. Any other questions? Well, thank you, Vanessa. Thank so you. I look for motions on this. Um, let's see here. We got a, um, a motion to uh, pass resol recommend rec resolution number 18-51 authorizing the mayor to sign 
a bridge improvement grant application for the Third Avenue Northwest Bridge Replacement Project, number 1706. Is there a motion and a second? So moved. Moved by Y, second by Manti. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Into the consent carried. agenda. Yeah, the consent agenda, or is that just something? I will move it? that when we get to the okay next agenda. It's it's just on the full agenda right now. Sure. And then um, the second part of that consideration for professional service agreements with IDG related to the project design, and we have uh, one for the bridge itself, and and one for the roadway, not including the bridge. That is correct, and the, the one for the structure is not in an amount not to exceed $95,500, and the one for the roadway is in an amount to exceed not to exceed $79,200. And I think I can take those together. Um, I'll look for a motion so second. Moved by Vilhauer, second. second by Bueller. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Thank you. Item number six is consideration of change order number three final for the shooting range project number 1619 with Browns Construction Company, Inc. for an increase of $22,171.55, bringing the contract price to $592,311.24. Look for a motion and second for approval on this, and then I'll let Heath explain it. Moved by Lalum, second by Solom. Heath. Thank you, Madam Mayor. The action before council this evening related to this project is a final change order to for a balance of quantities for the as constructed quantities on this project for the uh, Watertown gun range. Um, as most of you are aware, the work is, has been complete out there on the site. There is a little bit of subsidiary seating left to do, but uh, primarily the work is otherwise complete for this project and therefore we're processing this final change order. The brunt of this change order of that 22,171, roughly 18,000 of that is for a uh, new earthwork bid item that was added and negotiated a new price on. What happened there was uh, there were about, let me see, 6,000, roughly 6,000 cubic yards of extra black soil, topsoil uh, that needed to be uh, moved on this site. What happened uh, was a, on, a, on a couple different measures, the borrow area that was graded and stripped of uh, topsoil, um, some of the old existing berms out there from the uh, um, sanitary or the wastewater operations that used to exist on this site uh, had a lot more topsoil in them than what was anticipated. Some of those berms were built entirely of topsoil, uh, which caused that quantity to increase quite a bit on the project. And then what we also did with that excess material is built it into the cover on the berms of the gun range itself. So instead of, I think it was originally planned to have approximately six inches of black dirt on those berms, the shooting berms uh, that surround each of the, the target lanes, um, and we ended up with about eight to 10 inches of black dirt on those, which helps uh, the longevity of, of those berms, especially the area obviously where uh, the impact of the bullets are, occur at the end of the lanes. Um, but long story short, that is the increase in, in work and material there. We renegotiated a contract price of $3 per cubic yard as opposed to the original contract price of $4 per cubic yard because of the increased quantity that the project incurred. And that was in uh, agreement with the contractor, and that's the numbers before you this evening. All right, thank you. Are there any questions? See none, I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number seven is consideration of bid awards for the 2019 Petroleum Products and Street Maintenance Materials Project number 1813 to various contractors and suppliers at the designated pricing as outlined in the bid tabs and summary of apparent low bidders. I look for a motion second for recommendation. So moved. moved by Manti. Second. Se second by Albertson. And Heath. You want to give us a review of this? Absolutely, Madam Mayor. So before the council this evening on this item is the uh, annual 2019 Petroleum Products and Street Maintenance Materials 
several miscellaneous items on this bid that were put out. It, it gets kind of complex in that respect that each of these items, uh, it's, it's not like an overall construction project bid. Each one of these items were bid separately. We were provided a number from, in some cases, multiple vendors or suppliers for these uh, items. Generally speaking, this relates to hot mix and cold mix asphalt for general patchwork throughout the year that the streets department primarily uh, makes use of. Uh, it also includes pit run, crushed rock, crushed concrete, pea gravel, materials of that nature, and then also um, snow and ice uh, treatment material such as de-icing sand and uh, uh, salt and calcium chloride. Um, it's also the fuel bid for the year, so all the city's departments um, can utilize uh, and purchase fuel off these bids. And that also includes cutting edges for the streets, uh, plows and blades that uh, they use frequently throughout the year. Uh, again, just to note, this is a unit price bid. Uh, of course, it's up to each department to manage their budgets throughout the year, but at least with this bid uh, pending approval from council, they have a, a low bid price to go off of throughout the year for these types of materials as they need them. All right, any questions? Councilman Vilhauer? A couple of questions, Heath. Uh, there's a couple that we did not receive a bid on. What, what do we do then? That's a good question. I believe that's happened in the recent past. Um, I believe even last year's bids were void of some of these items being bid on. And I know the street superintendent, Rob, is here tonight. I don't know if you can chime in on this, too. But I believe what they do, if they're in need of that material throughout the year, they would just call and uh, receive estimates or prices from different suppliers or vendors and try to make it as competitive they, as they can for those types of materials. Okay. And, and then also another question is, on the gas and diesel, do, does the gas, does that, does that include use of E30 where, where a possible? Yeah, we've been using E30 in all of our gas vehicles. Okay. I've directed our staff to use E30. And they give us a six cent discount? Uh, I don't know what the I think current they do. contract I'm is. I'm pretty sure they do. I don't think that's in the contract, but I think they've been honoring it for all of their different fuel types. Um, Councilman Lalam? Rob, how are we uh, comparable-wise, like, with our uh, hot mix and things like that? Are we similar to last year? Uh, actually, the I believe we are very close on that. Our cold mix did go up quite a bit um, from last year. Uh, our our de-icing, our salt, went up a lot, too. The bid, actually, our current, uh, current vendor is uh, Blackstrap, and I think they actually went up, like, $30 a ton. But... They're not the low bidder on this next one. I think we're paying sixty six or sixty six fifty currently. I don't, that's probably up there somewhere. But um, and I think they're coming in at seventy. Johnson Feed is coming in seventy something a ton. So so prices are going up on some of our materials. Our our cutting edges have went down about five dollars uh, or ten dollars. I think it is per set. So so we did more patchwork and things of that this year than we have in the past, correct? We've done a lot more uh, roadway paving. The patching, uh, as Dunnix was, they were not able to do as much patching for us outside of the standard project, um, the paving project. So we did as much as we always do. Um, and actually this coming summer we should be doing a lot more because we'll have one more staff member added after the first year. So are we going to be able to continue to do more resurfacing and things like that with the lower prices? Uh, that's iffy because what last year we, we received good prices because we were doing um, long stretches of roadway out by the Lake Golf Course Road. Um, when vendors or contractors bid that, they, they drop their prices quite a bit just because it's not in town. There's not a lot of, uh, you don't have curb and gutter to deal with. It's, it's a lot easier for them to straight line pave stuff. So their prices were really good last year. I don't know that we'll see as good of prices when it comes to our mill and overlay project. But this here is, is just our materials pricing for if we purchase hot mix or cold mix through our department. Okay, just so the general population knows that this is yeah. affect the actual mill and overlay correct projects okay 
We bid out the mill and overlay closer to the spring sure. time at the request of Dunnick. Actually, we used to bid them out together, and people probably remember those all coming out this time of year. But it's, um, you know, those are big dollar amounts and big risk with that being so much time in between. So we, we move those closer to the actual season. Sounds good. And Councilman Lallum, if I, if I may add, just to point out, uh, two of the items that incurred the largest increase were de-icing sand, an increase of almost 18%, and the uh, rock salt of an increase of about 19% that Rob had talked about. The hot and cold mix were a little over 1%, so nominal effect on the hot mix, and then about 8% on the cold mix increase. So we're really hoping for no snow or ice then. <laughs> That's right. We have a pretty good stockpile right now, so if we have a light winter, it will be okay next year. I got a feeling Rob's always hoping for no snow or ice, no matter <laughs> what these prices are. <laughs> always. All right, any other questions? I'll look for action. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. Item number eight is the snow removal presentation by Street Superintendent Rob Bainan. So take it away, Rob. All right, I'll roll through this quick. We're short on time here, but I actually shorten things up a lot just for that reason. Um, all right, here, let's see. All right, um, this, uh, which what you all have uh, on the agenda is the actual uh, summary or the report. Um, we did do a slideshow of the presentation here. I also brought, uh, you have right in front of you, um, this presentation as well. So it'll be streamlined a lot. I won't bore you to death. So, okay, um, this, the information that I'm presenting to you, it covers last winter. So you have an idea. Actually, I was going to do this um, two weeks to a month ago, but... It didn't pan out. So anyway, it covers from October 10th of 17 to April 4th, uh, or April 17th of 2018. So that was last winter, basically. Um, uh, one thing that you should know is, uh, which I've explained before, but two inches is kind of the trigger point where we go out and plow snow. We do go out and manage ice or slippery conditions when it's warranted. Whenever the roads start to get slick, we we send sanders out um, and we handle it. We did have, like for example, the other night when we have ra or had the rain, we had sanders out at three in the morning. We had all of our sanders going, so we were out doing that. And by three in the morning and by eight o'clock, they were all the main routes were sanded up good and safe. So, um, all right. Uh, some of our priority snow removal and ice management uh, routes that we, we prioritize, number one on the list, the highways 81, 212, and 20 are primary. We, we will go out and do those first. We sand those first. We plow snow first on those. If there's any issues, you know, with snow piling up, we'll drop what we're doing and we'll go back and do those. Um, the emergency snow routes, which you'll see on the next uh, slide, which is a map, um, is our next thing that we focus on, which you know goes by the hospital and comes close to all the schools. It actually goes by all the schools, but I think too it comes within a block of those. Um, third on the list, schools and hospitals, um, which we've extended our route past 14th Avenue North on 11th Street East. So we go through the roundabout and we go up to the new middle school, and then now we are including 18th Avenue and going west to the highway, to Highway 81. Um, we felt that was necessary, and there's been, there's been uh, requests for that. So um, next we focus on the downtown business core. Uh, other important roadways that we actually focus on right up front is we try to get north and south Lake Drive. We hit the South Bypass, uh, Willow Creek Drive, and, and we do hit the airport road with all the activity going on there. We try to get in there and sand that up for all of our travelers in and out of the airport. Um, if police and fire have any calls where they need assistance, we'll drop what we're doing and we'll deal with theirs. Uh, it's generally that doesn't happen a lot, but if there's an emergency, we'll drop what we're doing and go deal with that. So um, the map, this is an old map, but it does show the basics of the snow routes, emergency snow routes in town. Um, what you don't see on there is 
well, you don't see a lot of what we deal with when we do the snow routes and highways. We hit the South Bypass, Willow Creek Drive. We hit the lake, the main lake road. Of course, 11th Street East up to 18th Avenue and over. Um, we also include a little bit of area out by the Redland Center with all the, the work. There's a lot of workers out in that area. Um, we try to hit that as well. Um, let's see, variables to count for during ice and snow events. Um, that contributes to how long it takes to plow the roads or uh, sand the roads and also the cost you know is is if we have ice ahead of the snow events the depth of the snow the density of the snow that's that's a very big deal you can have seven inches of fluffy snow is very different than seven inches of wet and heavy snow and there's times when we'll we'll have over or right at two inches of snow that's dry or uh, not dry but fluffy snow um, it's very different than wet and heavy snow so we'll react differently to that how we manage the 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 event um, what also accounts uh, during those events uh, staffing for the street department contractor availability illnesses or vacation for our staff we have a lot of senior staff with five weeks of vacation um, equipment breakdowns, the wind. If the wind blows, it causes us to replow areas. That, that happens quite a bit where we'll replow an area because of wind. Uh, Excuse the days, me. Yeah. Councilman Vilhauer has a question. Rob, mm -hmm. sorry, apologize for interrupting. But can I touch on the combination of the wind and the depth? I mean, you're, you're referencing two inches several times, and I respect that. But also, we get in, I, I'm just thinking a couple of weeks ago, we had, to me, I didn't think it was quite two inches, or maybe it was, but anyway, we had an awful lot of wind that in some place that still piled that up to, you know, several feet deep in places with the way the wind was blowing. How, how do you, how do you, what do you do with something like that? In those situations, we do, if we're aware of certain areas that have blown in, we will go in and plow those specific areas. Because you're correct, there's areas that we'll get the wind, we'll have a half inch of snow that hit the ground, but the wind will blow certain areas in really bad, and we'll try to try to deal with those areas. But it's more of a spot, spot cleaning rather than a general. Okay. Right. And, and there is, um, you know, if, we, if, if there's so many areas that are like that, we'll just call a snow alert and we'll do the, the whole city. Um, we're currently discussing the, the idea of bringing something to you guys about revising the ordinance for snow alerts when we can call them or trigger them. Um, and Matt's been looking for us at what Sioux Falls is doing and we're looking at modeling af after what they have in place. So that's something we're looking at and probably we'll be bringing to you in the near future. Um, but yes, there, when, when we have a lot of the town that's blowing in, we'll just call snow alert and we'll run every road in town. And some of them have nothing and others, you know, will have a foot or two of snow, so. Um, and the only way to really know is to actually really just run the whole city, make the motions. Um, but yeah, the, the, the days of the week matter as far as cost. And, and on weekends, if we plow on Sundays, it's double time for our staff. So um, when you see us out on a Sunday, we try not to, but there's, we, we had to do it a couple weeks ago. We had seven hours on a Sunday. So that gets more expensive with staff there. But contractors, of course, we... We try to call them in whenever. It's the same price with them. Um, let's see. When we start and end plowing, that matters as far as how long it takes to plow the city because we do go home with our, our staff goes home and rests. Uh, the time of the year, in the spring of the year, of course, the melting, that assists us a ton. Just like the first snow event this year assisted us. We, we got some snow. Um, and by the following Tuesday, I think we had gotten snow on a Friday, I believe, um, or Saturday. And following Tuesday, it was all melted away. We did do some plowing in that event. But um, when we get towards the spring, it definitely melts faster. The brine, if we pre-treat stuff, we, it definitely helps melt that stuff. Uh, in the spring of the year is when the brine really is most effective. So um, total overall cost... <laughs> Attributed to contractor charges, cutting edges, sand salt mix, standard wages, and overtime wages, fuel and gas. Um, as far as the standard wages that I have in the report that you guys have, that does not include my wages or the foreman's wages because no matter what we put in, it's the same 
uh, standard wage for time, and we don't, I don't include the administrative assistant in that either. So those wages that you see are basically our full-time staff and our seasonal workers that come in to, to help. Uh, last year, we had 19 total events. 12 events were snow, basically, and seven events were ice. Um, as you'll see here, now that's kind of, yeah, that's not too bad to see. Um, some of these events, I broke it down there, and, and you guys can take a look, but you'll see that uh, ice events, obviously, when we're just sanding, that's a, that's a lot cheaper, obviously, but uh, we did remove an inch and a half of snow. Uh, it must have been wet, heavy snow. I don't recall, but it's all documented, so it's probably in your summary. Um, but it was 20000 bucks to remove an inch and a half of snow. Um, it gets quite expensive. Now, sanding, you know, when we're sanding, if icy conditions reoccur, we'll go back out and sand. But it's cheap to sand compared to starting to plow. It's very expensive to plow. Um, you'll see our most expensive event was the last one of the year, and it blew. We had a lot of wind. And... If you look at your summary, you'll see that event number 19, it talks about we had to go back and replow stuff. Uh, matter of fact, that total time frame that we were plowing was 78 and a half hours. Um, you know, because the snow would come down, then it, we'd be plowing and more would come down the next day. So it wasn't, it wasn't like it just quit and you could just finish up. But... That, that event cost about $47,000 to clear, so it was very expensive. Um, you know, I'll run over quick. Uh, event number 11, 12, 13, and 17 took roughly 32 hours average to clear from start to finish, and that was with our staff going home and sleeping. Um, so that's a two-and-a-half to three-inch, three-inch... Um, you know, it's it's anywhere from two and a half to five inches of snow is takes about that depending on when it falls and when we start, but you're looking at around 30, 33 hours um, to clear it with our current staff. Um, okay, so our average, though, if you include that last event, which was an odd one, uh, brought our average to plow the city round average in 48 hours or two days um, which is you know that's that's pretty accurate our, our quickest event took 30 hours last year to, to plow every 220 miles of streets and alleys so I thought that was pretty good um, let's see last year we used 10 a little over 10,000 gallons of brine which was a cost of a little over a thousand bucks in materials. It doesn't include labor to mix it or anything like that, but uh, that's the material cost. Um, total tonnage of sand used last now or last season was a little over three thousand ton, which was about forty-seven thousand dollars, and that does not include labor uh, as well. So. I didn't think that was too bad, too, considering we sand. Every time it's ice or snow, we sand. So, you know, you're looking at 47000 bucks for 19 sanding missions, or 18, I guess. We, have, we had one mission that things were melting, and um, so we only have 18 events recorded where we sanded. Um, contractor help compared to city help. Uh, last year, I think we were pretty close to about this average, but if you look through your summary, you'll see as well, it breaks down every snow event. We have a pie chart that shows what percentage was city staff compared to contractor staff. Uh, it's rough. Well, in this case, it averaged last year 63% uh, city staff and 37% contractor staff, but about 60-40, real close to that. Um, uh, let's see, what else? Hey, Rob, if I may. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, over here. Oh, there. Yeah. Um, has the contractor availability changed over the recent past year? I know it's something I'm you I'm glad you about. mentioned that because that was something that I wanted to talk to the council about. Um, we are seeing that a lot of the contractors that are doing this type of work are aging and retiring. Uh, last 
event a week and a half ago or so, we had seven contractors that were not available because of either they're ready to retire, they're down south, or, you know, certain issues, health issues, but seven of them. And that, that, was a, that made a big difference. Uh, south of Highway 212, which normally is done by contractors other than sanding, um, we had to do with our city forces. And we're starting to see an issue with that. Um, Pinky Burns, who does the lake, I had to actually, <laughs> he wasn't going to plow this year. He's, he's health-wise, he's in tough shape, and, and his family is, has some issues with health right now, too. So he's looking at retiring. I'm not sure if his son Cody's going to continue the business or not, but he does everything west of 21st Street out to the lake and um, uh, Summerwood and um, Derby Downs. You know, it's a big deal what he does for us. So, and Danny Deutsch, who does south of 212, is is injured right now. His back is, he's not able to even get in a motor grader. So, so we're having some issues with some very important contractors where they're, you know, I think they're reaching a time when they want to retire or we're just, we, we have, I think next year is going to be a little different what we have to deal with. So it's something to, Maybe keep in mind there, I, I'd like to inform you some more on what's going on as it happens, but you know, I've had sit-downs with some of the contractors trying to see where their future stands and if they can help us. Um, and so that's, that's a concern of mine right now. These, these contractors, are they typically a one-man operation then? If, if Pinky's out, then he, he's out? Correct. Uh, Pinky, in his case, it's, it's him and his son, Cody. So there's two motor graders there. Danny Deutsch runs a motor grader for us, while Lucas, his son, runs a loader and circles up all of our cul-de-sacs and our wellness center he does, library, um, and the Boys and Girls Club. So, um, and then Lauren Beld with l l does our event center. Um, you know, some of those guys, like Lauren, I've asked him if he's willing to expand, and he's just, he's, he has too much work to expand his operation. But... Um, I did have a fella in that's looking at buying, he was in today, and I, he's looking at buying a loader for next year. Um, so that would be somebody new on the list. We're short two contractor loaders this year, or we were the last event, and, and we noticed. I mean, it, it's, it really makes our guys have to hustle and put in extra time. It took us about, I think, 58 hours this last event, and it would have went a lot quicker uh, if we had the help. So when, when these guys do bid, where, when we got bids last time we took bids, mm -hmm. were there people that were thrown out because they didn't meet qualifications or something? I mean, um, are there guys out there that aren't meeting the qualifications? I, th I think everybody that bid met all the qualifications. They do have to have insurance, and um, Kristen could talk about that, but they have to have proof of insurance they bring up to City Hall before they can work for us. Um, we do require that they're, we ask them that they have their lights and their boxes working and stuff, but because um, there's some rickety <laughs> trucks that pull in once in a while, and you, we've had to send some trucks home because the tailgates won't latch, you know, and they're dumping half the snow down, down the road we just plowed, so. <laughs> no. Um, Rob, do we have some flexibility as far as getting other people? I mean, can we pull from other departments and... That's what we're we're talking about. I've been talking with Audra a little bit uh, in HR, and I I think I briefly mentioned to Kristen too. But um, you know that would definitely help. Um, and I know there's departments. I've been I actually talked with one of the departments. I know that during the winter time the the duties are reduced, and maybe we could pull some of those types of people in um, to help haul snow, even if they couldn't run. You know, like a loader or blade, we wouldn't expect that. But, but to haul a snow truck, in that case, just hauling a snow truck, they'd only need a Class B CDL. Is that something that we could do? Is get people uh, CDL trains and their license could have that and things of that absolutely. nature. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, that would, I would think that if we had some areas that we could pull from, that would help your mm -hmm. guys' case out. It would help uh, tremendously if we could, if we can, if we can put other people from other departments in snow hauling trucks and sander type trucks without the plows on the front just going out on sanding missions that would help tremendously because then we can focus our current staff in loaders and blades well it might help the other departments as far as their payroll if we can 
move some of the street department payroll into theirs. Right. You know, they're not yeah. running all that overhead as well. It'd be a nice way to get uh, people to have all their hours and right. assist yep. you guys. Immensely. And it, it would help, I mean, if, if we can snag some of those um, workers from other departments during the snow events for two, three days, um, it'd be tremendous. It would really help. Is, so, is there an interest in that? And, and I, are we talking one guy or is there six people? Go ahead, Kristen. I think the thing that we're still having to look at and consider is a lot of the positions that we would be discussing are all fall within a union representation. So we do have to be careful because there's the job description tie-ins and stuff like that. So I, I think at this point there's probably some more homework to do on that. Sioux Falls does it extensively and we visited with with their street superintendent last year about how we could maybe model after them and it's it's an option it, it'll take some reworking of the way we do things is it like a hybrid position then where they're multiple departments type deal or multiple departments but they part of their job description is that they plow snow as needed they get they're on the call out as well can we do like a part-time or temporary type help for that we could but we're going to have the same problem with part-time workers that we're having with contractors. Right. Well, the only thing I'm thinking is if someone want, can do the work, but they don't own the equipment is what I'm thinking. So right. if we have equipment that they could use, you know, that would be something where we could hire them on a per case basis type of deal. And there is currently, I have uh, four seasonal workers hired that come in and drive snow hauling trucks. Now uh, the one is out, for the season because of a shoulder injury but um these are retired folks that um just want something to do um they get up at two in the morning and come in and drive our snow hauling we're trucks glad to us. have them absolutely they they help tremendously so well i could um, think of like contractors and stuff that during the winter their time slows down and things of that nature maybe that would be and that might be an option too what one thing we'd have to look at is you know our our staff when it comes to motor graders, that's the premium. The guys really want to be in those motor graders. But we have snow hauling trucks that sometimes we don't have an operator for. So, and sanders, where because we're using snow gates, we're not using the plow trucks with the the sanders as much. But we need somebody following the team up. Otherwise, we have to have, you know, we're short sometimes on sanders uh, to follow up the team as we go and plow. There's Council probably a couple Roby? people up here that would do it. Yeah, there's yeah. a guy here that doesn't do anything. Well, we'd have to give him hand controls rather yeah, than yeah. foot controls, I guess. <laughs> comment and a question. Uh, the comment is the city departments, your department, the street department, has been at about 12 employees for about the last 15 years. Is that correct? Yeah, and we're actually stay. currently at 10 full-time employees uh, for workers. Um, All right, so that, that that's been that. steady. Um, We've got an issue with contractors, so the yellow flag's waving. The other thing I would point out, though, it's, it's an obvious one, but the number of streets you plow never goes down. What is the mileage? If, you, if I recall going you know, down a street twice, is, you know, that counts as two trips. The last I heard is well over 300 miles. Actually, as far as streets and alleys that we maintain, right now it's right at about 220. Now, that, that's just one direction. If you count lane miles, you have the highway, which would be five times back and forth on on all of 212 and part of 81 um, highway 20 i think you'd have mostly four but but yeah and every other street you'd be looking at two lanes and 19th street you'd be looking at three so sometime i i will figure that out how many lane miles we have but we do every year we get a little bit more added on um like this year 8th avenue and 26th street uh, out by trav's outfitter you know the, it doesn't seem like a lot but in five years, we've probably come up with several miles of streets that have been added to our, our plowing area. So, um, but yeah, we definitely have uh, something coming up as far as contractors. There's, you just don't see 30-year-old guys buying $300,000 motor graders and starting a business. It, it just doesn't happen. Um, these guys that are retiring are all in their 70s, close to 80. Um, you know, Pinky, I think, has been doing a lake for 30 years. Uh, he's, he's tired. <laughs> so. All right. 
Councilman um, White. So can, so can you said we've got four seasonal workers, one is out. Are you replacing that one? And then can we bring on more? Or is that not in your? We, it's not in my budget. Um, I did add one this fall. We did have three, now we have four. And, and I did it knowing this one person is kind of, I think he's kind of on his way to full retirement. He's approaching, I think he's 77 or 78 years old. So he's, he's uh, just wants to slow down a little bit, so. But those guys, boy, they're, they're great. Our, we call them our antique teenagers. Um, every one of them is on time and, and just great. They, they do it because they enjoy it. They don't do it for the money. So, um, I guess one last slide. Um, there's your breakdown. Last year, uh, including fuel and gas, standard wages, overtime wages, sand salt mix, brine, cutting edges, and contractor charges came out to $309,066.94. Um, the average cost for ice management alone throughout the season would have been about 2600 bucks each event, and the average snow plowing uh, cost per event, the average was about 24000 So. Do you that remember kind of, what it was the prior winter? It was a lot less. I don't. I think we were under two hundred thousand the last winter. We had thirteen events that year, and we had nineteen last year. Um, I guess we'll see how this goes. Now, and we count when we're out sandy doing sandy missions for rain. You know, because like we had the other night, um, we we keep track of all that. We track all of our sand and our time that they punched in till they were done sanding. It's a lot of tracking, but well, but this is an excellent this. report. Thank you very much for giving. Will this Thank be you. on the website? Yeah, I uh, actually, yeah, we'll make sure it's on there. Yeah. I, I don't know if Sue already has it on it's there great or not, information. but I'll check. Thank you very much. Thanks. Next item on the agenda is old business. Is there any old business? See none. Is there any new business? And there, uh, we will not be going into executive session tonight, and so I'll look for a motion to adjourn. Oh, I got a whole bunch of them. I'll say, <laughs> move by solemn, second by lalem. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye. aye. Those opposed, signify by saying nay. Motion carries. We are adjourned. We'll be back at 5:30 for the council meeting.